What's up, booktube? It's Peg, back at the history shelf. I am here with a few more books. Um, these are books that I have either ordered, um, used, online, obviously, um, or were graciously sent to me from publishers. And um, in the hopes that I will read and review, and I very much would like to, I need some help though. I need some help uh, choosing which one or ones um, to review. But either way, I'm going to show them on this channel and uh, get you guys' input. Some of them look really interesting, like, again, opening up a whole new world of history that I never knew existed before. In fact, I know one of them. I, I think I already know that I'm going to review it anyway. But I want to see if you guys tell me that's the one you want me to review. Okay, let's start with the used books first. Um, oh, a couple of videos ago, I told you guys about discovering a writer, Enrique Krauts, um, a Latin American historian, um, from an article, a profile they did on him in the National Review magazine. Uh, I was utterly intrigued, and they had made reference to some of his works. And um, so in my last video, I showed you, I ordered, used um, his big epic biogra biography, History of Mexico, Biography of Power, A History of Modern Mexico, um, 1810 to 1996, Enrique Kraus. Um, ordered it used, in great condition. I think I got it from Midtown Scholar books, Bookshop, which is just, as you know, one of my favorites. Oh my gosh, my microphone was miles away. I hope you heard all that. Mexico, Enrique Kraus. Uh, I had ordered this one a few weeks ago. You know what? And now Gidget has to go outside, and Martine has left the room. Uh, let me see if I can pause this. One moment, please. And I'm back. Wow, we'll see how that looks. Anyway, um, okay. Well, this I had ordered the second book at the same time that I uh, ordered the, Mex the uh, Mexico Biography of a Power, um, but it took forever to get here. I just think it was... So third... Oh, this was also Midtown Scholar. I think they just had a hard time... Oh, maybe they were a little understaffed. I don't know, but it took forever to get here, but I have it now, and it's going to go on the shelf alongside Mexico. Um, this is Enrique Krauss's Redeemers, Ideas and Power in Latin America. Um, and it's a por uh, the book contains just portraits of all the folks listed here, uh, such as... Um, um, let me, let me read you a quick synopsis, though, just so you know what, what, what his take on this is. Uh, Latin America has been of vital importance to the United States almost since the birth of our nation, and the significance of this relationship has only increased in recent decades. Uh, but mutual understanding between these regions is lacking, even as Latin Americans are striving to promote the values of democracy in their native countries and beyond. Boomer! They always do this to me. Why has this process proved to be such a struggle? And what does the future of the region hold? In Redeemers, acclaimed historian Enrique Kraus uh, presents the major ideas that have formed the modern Latin American political mind during the late 19th and 20th centuries, from early post-colonial authoritarian regimes. I don't know why I smiled at that. I'm, I'm so used to kind of looking up and you know connecting with you guys and smiling. I'm not smiling at authoritarian regimes. Um, from early post-colonial authoritarian regimes to 19th century liberalism and conservatism, and then the impact of socialism and Marxism, as well as nationalism and indigenism, and the movement toward liberal democracy of recent years. Okay. Um, Krauss looks closely at how these ideas have been expressed in the lives of influential revolutionaries, thinkers, poets, smile at poets, and novelists, uh, figures whose lives were marked by a passionate involvement in history, power, and for some revolution, as well as a personal commitment to love, friendship, and family. Krauss's subjects come from across the continents. Here are the Cuban uh, Jose Marti, the Argentines uh, Che Guevara, and uh, Evita Perón, the groundbreaking political thinkers Jose uh, Vasconcelos of Mexico and Jose Carlos Mariatigue from Peru. I, I apologize if I'm 
I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, writers Jose Enrique Rodo, Mario Vargas Losa, Octavio Paz, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez reinforce the importance of imagination to inspire social change. Uh, Redeemers also highlights Mexico's Samuel Ruiz and Subcomandante Marcos and Venezuela's President Hugo Chavez and their influence on contemporary Latin America. In this brilliant and deeply researched history, Enrique Kraus uses the range of these extraordinary lives to eliminate the struggle uh, that has defined Latin American history, um, an ever precarious balance between the ideal of democracy and the temptation of political messianism. Through this comprehensive collage of the distinct but interconnected experiences and views of these 12 fascinating cultural and political figures, we can better understand how this balance continues to affect Latin America today and how its nations will define themselves and relate to the larger world in the years ahead. Um, that is outstanding. Yeah, Enrique Kraus. He uh, lives in, I think, Mexico City. And, uh, um, yeah, he's he's written for New York Times. Let's see here. He's written for the New York Times, The New Republic, Descent, The Washington Post, and The New York Review of Books. And he is the director of the Clio TV Productions and the editor-in-chief of Letras Libres magazine. So, uh, I'm really excited to explore Enrique Krauss's work. I love learning about new, uh, not only just new writers, but historians in general. And I love it when I find uh, historians from other countries. Um, yeah, I read a, a ton of, you know, American historians, British historians, but uh, this is going to be great because I just, I think it was really valuable to see history through the eyes of someone from a, um, a non-European country. It really can just, uh, it just challenges you. Yeah, and it's great, and I love it. And I've been really in getting into Latin American history lately. That book on Colombia that I've, I've told you guys many times about just really was just like, wow, just what a rich area, a rich history. Um, just the biological diversity of, of these, of these uh, countries is just mind-blowing, you know? Um, anyway, so we've got... The works of Enrique Kraus. All right, the, the other used book I bought, this is for a buddy read that um, will be starting, I think, in about a week uh, with Sharon Goforth and John David. Now, Sharon used to have a booktube channel. I think it's still up. Um, and uh, I know John David. I'll, I'll link um, their channels below. Um, but uh, I'm not sure how I, I... I guess I kind of invited my, myself into this one. <laughs> I heard that they were going to be reading together uh, Henry Steele Commager's The American Mind. And I was able to find a used copy. A really nice used copy. I think I also got this from Midtown Scholar. And this is the 1951 edition. That's what it says, at least. I don't know if... This one is... Uh... It says copyright 1950. Yale University Press. It's in beautiful condition. Um... This is a book written out of a passionate belief, just giving you the synopsis, out of a passionate belief in the staying powers of the democratic principles. In it, Henry Steele Commager examines the work of philosophers, clergymen, novelists, poets, journalists, magazine editors, sociologists, econ economists, political theorists, and statesmen, and reflects on the interpretations of other historians to interpret the American mind and the forces that made it. Um... So that's the brief synopsis. It was blurbed by Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Um, and let's see what the table of contents. As you can see, that's that, that's that, that definitely looks like old time, like 1950s contents page, just by the type itself. Why can't I ever straighten this? There we go. All right. So, yeah, um, <laughs> I'm really stoked for this. This should be pretty good, and I'm betting you any money I'm going to be buying more books after this is over. Because just looking at the bibliography, you you go you go down the the well, man. You just woo. 
Oof, so much more to read. That's what I love about history. It's endless. American Mind, Buddy Read. <clears throat> okay, so then these next three are um, new releases by different presses. Um, we've got a book from Johns Hopkins University, a book from the University of Nebraska, Nebraska Press, which I had actually had requested. And then, um, yeah, one I requested, two that were sent. Um, and... Uh, it's my goal to like to to give you a rundown on all of them, but I really need your guys' help into into you know knowing which one to really dig into, which ones you're really looking forward to. Let's start with the fabulous people at Naval Institute Press. I know this book is going to blow the socks off a certain guy in Vermont. I'm thinking Mark at Richardson Reads, my uh, my 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 uh, ex Coast Guard buddy over there that loves all things maritime history. This is history I get excited about. This is something I've never heard of before. <laughs> this is Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy by Skip Finley. This is by U.S. Naval Institute Press. Let me read you the synopsis for this. Actually, I have the cup sheet right here. I'll hold the book up for you guys. Okay. Uh, the history of whaling as an industry on this continent has been well told in books, including some that have been bestsellers. But what hasn't been told is the story of whaling's leaders of color in an era when the only other option was slavery. Whaling was one of the first American industries to exhibit diversity. Did not know that. A man became a captain not because he was white or well-connected, but because he knew how to kill a whale. Uh, along the way, he could learn navigation and reading and writing. Whaling presented a tantalizing alter alternative to mainland life. Working with archival records at whaling museums and libraries from private archives and interviews with people whose ancestors were whaling masters, Finley culls stories from the lives of over 50 black whaling captains to create a portrait of what life was like for these leaders of color on the high seas. Um, Let's see here. Uh, each time a ship spotted a whale, uh, a group often including the captain would jump into a small boat, row to the whale, and attack it, at times with the captain delivering the killing blow. The first, second, or third mate and boat steerer could eventually have opportunities to move into increasingly responsible roles. Uh, Finley explains how this skills-based system propelled captains of color to the helm. The, the book concludes as facts and factions conspired to kill the industry, including wars, weather, bad management, poor judgment, disease, obsolescence, obsolescence, obsolescence sorry, and a non-renewable natural resource, uh, the whale. Um, ironically, the end of the Civil War allowed the African Americans who were captains to exit the difficult and dangerous occupation and make room for the Cape Verdean who picked up the mantle literally to the end of the industry. Hmm. Wow. Fascinating. It's even blurbed by uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, who wrote In the Heart of the Sea, um, who said, much more than a prodigious work of scholarship, Will and Captains of Color is also an entertaining read that puts the focus where it properly belongs on the multicultural essence of a fishery that spanned the globe. Highly recommended. That's Nathaniel Philbrick. I'm excited. Um, what do you think, guys? Should this be one of the first that I, uh, I, I dig into immediately and um, give you guys a review? We're looking at, oh, and there's a wonderful selective bibli bibliography. There's going to be a ton of stuff I can, I can follow up on here. A uh, bunch of appendices. Very cool. A bunch of lists with the men's, men's names. Let me see if I can show you some picture. Uh, it's about a little over 200 pages, so I uh, just really make sure I get everything else done by I have some deadlines coming up I can get this one started let me know we've got some pictures here this is fascinating wow bunch of bunch of great photos of the ships oh wow Nantucket to New Bedford what a beautiful book. 
fabulous. Very excited for Whaling Captains of Color. So that arrived. Okay, the next book is um, kind of in the vein of, I think, um, This Republic of Suffering by Drew Gilpin Faust. But this one it mostly has to do more with, um, well, I think it's, maybe it's similar. I'll know once I read it. But this is from the University of Nebraska Press. This is Death at the Edges of... Death at the Edges of Empire, Fallen Soldiers, Cultural Memory, and the Making of an American Nation, 1863 to 1921. Uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals perished in the epic conflict of the American Civil War. As battles raged and the specter of death and dying hung over the divided nation, the living worked not only to bury their dead, but also to commemorate them. President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address perhaps best voiced the public yearning to memorialize the war dead. His address marked the beginning of a new tradition of commemorating American soldiers and also signaled a transformation in the relationship between the government and the citizenry through an embedded promise and obligation for the living to remember the dead. And I apologize for my phone going off here. Okay, I'm really not that popular. That's a fluke. I'll tell you what, that's a fluke. Okay. In Death at the Edges of Empire, Shannon Bontranger, I'm sorry, I didn't say her name, yeah, but, or did I, by Shannon Bontranger. In, in Death at the Edges of Empire, Bontranger examines the culture of death, burial, and commemoration of American war dead. It really, that does sound a lot like this Republic of Suffering, but let's continue. Um, by focusing on the Civil War, the Spanish-Cuban-American War, oh, she's, she's broadening her focus, not just Civil War, um, the Philippine-American War and World War I, Bot Ranger produces a history of collective memories of war expressed through Amer American cultural traditions emerging within broader transatlantic and transpacific networks. Examining the pragmatic collaborations between middle-class Americans and government officials negotiating the contradictory terrain of empire and nation, Death at the Edges of Empire shows how Americans imposed modern order on the inevitability of death as well as how they use the war dead to reimagine political identities and opportunities into imperial ambitions. Okay, so that was a mouthful, but um, it's about 300 pages. And uh, table of contents, uh, they're, they're broken, the book is broken up into parts, which I think is revealing about how, how the topic is approached. Part one is called storage. Uh, part two, retrieval. And part three, communication. So, um, storage, I guess, would be obviously where remains would, would be buried as far as monuments and things like that. Retrieval um, would focus on uh, those lost overseas and uh, what was done to try to return them home. Um, talks about the main that was the main that the ship that was sunk under dubious circumstances that precipitated the Spanish-American, uh, Spanish-Cuban-American War. And then we have, what do we have here? We get communication. Um, so cultural memory in the information age, listening to empire epilogue, reclaiming Lincoln's promise, question mark. So this seems fairly um, along the lines, like I said, of uh, this Republic of Suffering by Drew Gilpin Faust, but this one takes a broader approach in that it looks at other wars, not just the Civil War, but it includes the Civil War, at least from 1863 on, starting um, at Gettysburg. So um, we have lots of pictures in the center. This looks like uh, the trenches at World War, not the trenches, but that looks like a World War I battlefield or cemetery. Um, Oh, what wonderful photographs, too. This is also World War I. Um, these are the nurses. Nurses at a hospital. Looks like also World War I. Or maybe it might have been earlier. If that could have been Philippine-American or Spanish-American War. It doesn't really say here. Um, a lot of these I've never seen before, these photos. So this is... 
Fantastic. Got some. Ooh. That's a panoramic shot of. Uh, sorry, my dogs are acting up. Of a dam. Panoramic shot of the dam. Oh, this was this was the uh, USS Maine wreckage lying in Havana Harbor, uh, taken in 1900. Sailors' bones remained in the hulk until the Army Corps of Engineers retrieved them a decade later. Wow, I don't think I've ever seen that picture. So that's that's the USS Maine. What's what's left of it at the bow? The bow sticking out. That's what it looks like. I could be wrong. You tell me, Mark. <laughs> so this is a new release from the, the great people at University of Nebraska Press. And then the final book is Johns Hopkins University. Um, let's see if I have a, something to read while I hold this up for you guys. Oh, come on. No, that's just the invoice or whatever. This is Breakaway Americas. The Unmanifest Future of the Jacksonian United States by Thomas Richards Jr. <laughs> Excuse me. He's <laughs> drinking some soda. Um, yep, Johns Hopkins University Press. This is a fairly interesting take on the Jacksonian time frame. So check this out. Um, most Americans know that the state of Texas was once the Republic of Texas, an independent sovereign state that existed from 1836 until its annexation by the United States in 1846. 1846, so 10 years. But few are aware that thousands of Americans, inspired by Texas, tried to establish additional sovereign states outside the borders of the early American Republic. In Breakaway Americas, Thomas Richards Jr. examined six such attempts and the groups that supported them. Patriots who attempted to overthrow British rule in Canada, post-removal Cherokees in Indian Territory, Mormons first in Illinois and then the Salt Lake Valley, I was aware of that, Anglo-American overland immigrants in both Mexican, California, and Oregon, and of course Anglo-Americans in Texas. Though their goals and methods varied, Richards argues that these groups had a common mi mindset. They were not expansionists. Instead, they hoped to form new independent republics based on the American American values that they felt were no longer recognized in the United States, which were land ownership, a strict racial hierarchy, and masculinity. Um, exposing 19th century Americans' lack of allegiance to their country, that's interesting. Exposing 19th century Americans' lack of allegiance to their country, which at the time was plagued with economic depression, social disorder, uh, and increasing sectional tension, Richards points us toward a new understanding of American identity and Americans as a people untethered from the United States as a country. Uh, through its wide focus on a ver diverse array of American political practices and ideologies, Breakaway Americas will appeal to anyone interested in the Jacksonian United States, U.S. politics, American identity, and the unpredictable nature of history. Ooh, Thomas Richards Jr. He's a PhD from uh, Temple University, and he's a history teacher at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy. So this is a brand new book. This Here's our author. Young guy. Uh, it's intriguing. It's an intriguing uh, premise. It's got several blurbs uh, by uh, historians here, published historians. So, I don't know, guys. What do you think? I've got three here. I'm not saying I won't do all three. If you want me to do all three, I can do all three. But which one should I do first? Um... I hear that I can't, I don't know if I can put a poll thing up in the uh, the video itself. So if you just comment below and I'll just aggregate the answers. I mean, if you guys are interested in any of these, if you're not interested in any three, obviously don't try to, you know, skew the, the curve or whatever. But um, we have Whaling Captains of Color by Skip Finley. Subtitle, America's First Meritocracy. That's a great, great subtitle. I love that. Um, U.S. Naval Institute Press. Then we have Death at the Edges of Empire 
Fallen Soldiers, Cultural Memory, and Make the Making of an American Nation, 1863 to 1921 by Sher Shannon Bontrager, University of Nebraska Press. And then finally, Breakaway Americas, The Unmanifest Future of the Jacksonian United States by Thomas Richards, Jr., Johns Hopkins. Okay, so that's the lineup. I'm asking you guys for a viewer vote. Um, which book would you like for me to, to explore first um, and report back on here uh, at the History Shelf? All right. I look forward to your input below. I um, ho hope you've enjoyed these new books. Um, I know, you know what, let me just throw this in here real quick because a few of you have said that you love that I'm showing my magazines. <sighs> I still need, still need to do a dedicated magazine um, episode, but I did get the new military heritage in the mail and they have gone oversized now. They have increased the size of their um, magazine, so it's definitely ugh, broader and look, at, I just, you know, folks, <laughs> just, I geek out. I love this stuff. Um, you know, and it covers all time frames, all wars and stuff, but, you know, if you're a military history geek like me, uh, military history or heritage magazine is a steal. I love it. So this is the new issue. This is the summer 2020. I think they've moved to a quarterly format. They used to be bi-monthly. So now it's, we're just getting it um, four times a year, but in, in a bigger, a bigger magazine. And they've gone from like, oh, uh, I think they went from like 80 pages to 100, so they've increased the, their pages. But anyway, okay, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> um, let me know what you think. I will commit to whatever book you guys uh, tell me. You know what, I guess as far as a time frame goes, and some people discover my videos a little later on, um, let's go from two weeks from today just because I have uh, some other things I need to wrap up by the 15th. So um, today's the 9th. So how about by end of day, June 22nd? I'll put all the stuff in the show notes below. Um, I'll take a look at all my comments from now until June 22nd. And then uh, whatever the highest number of books or the, the book that is mentioned the most that you vote for, obviously that's how it works. Uh, um, <laughs> that's the book I'll do. So... I'm excited. I'm excited for you guys to like drive the drive the car here. You know what I'm saying? And I just kind of chill out in the passenger seat, eat some Cheetos. Yeah, whatever. Okay, guys, that's another almost 30 minute video. I don't know where I have the energy to talk. I don't. I really don't. You know what? The books energize me. That's what that is. I love all this stuff. All right, you guys have a great Tuesday. Um, well, I shouldn't, I don't mean that. I mean, have as good a Tuesday as you can have considering everything going on. I, you know, uh, I don't know. Just have a great Tuesday and I will talk to you. Uh, I'll talk to you next time.